At this time, I invite you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. There was once a church clerk who filed his report to the association. This is something that every church does at the end of the church year, reporting such things as the number of baptisms and the number of new additions and the number of, of churches maybe planted or, or missions started or mission trips made or how many attended vacation Bible school, all of those types of, of data. This particular church clerk, as he filled it out, under each column, number of baptisms, he recorded zero. Other new additions, zero. New Churches started, zero. Mission trips made, zero. Attendance in vacation Bible school, zero. Throughout his report. And then at the end of the report, he re wrote down a little message. He said, brethren, pray for us that we may continue to hold our own. What a sad commentary that is for the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not implying that huge numbers are what the only thing that matters. But I believe that too many times church members have the same kind of attitude that church clerk had. And there are many, many churches corporately that have that same attitude, I'm afraid. The church of Jesus Christ is not here to hold our own. The church is called to be on the march, on the move, about God's business, just like any army has its marching orders, so too we are the army of God and we have our marching orders. Our army doesn't fight with guns and swords because this is a battle that's not an earthly battle. It's a spiritual battle. And it is indeed a battle in which we are engaged. So what then are the marching orders of the church? Well, I believe the answer to that is very simple to find. All we have to do is look at the words of Jesus. Just before he ascended back to heaven, the orders he left for his people, for his church, here we see, first of all, that they are authoritative orders. They're authoritative orders. Verse 18 says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And that word all means all. I like the way the New Living Translation renders this 
Complete authority. Complete authority. Jesus, in other words, has the right to tell us what to do. He is not only our shepherd, he is our commander-in-chief. He who bears his name, those of us who are Christians, we've received freedom, but along with that freedom comes a great deal of responsibility. Our freedom is not a freedom to make unilateral decisions. We don't tell God what to do. Instead, out of our gratitude for what He's done, out of our love for Christ, we must be obedient to His Word. In the Bible, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's very simple, you see. If we love someone, we show them. Jesus says, if you love me, the way you show me is by being obedient. Keep my commandments. And the question then for us is, do we really love Jesus? Oh, we we make a big deal out of saying we love Jesus. But do we really love him? We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. We get emotional when we share our testimonies in church. We get excited when we sing songs about heaven. But in the everyday decisions of our lives, do we really love Jesus? When we're at work, when we're at school, when we burn the dinner, when the car breaks down, when we're arguing with our spouses, Do we really love Jesus? It's during the times when our world seems to be falling apart that we must ask ourselves, do I really love Jesus? In the good times and in the bad times, are we consciously aware of our real love for Jesus, and even more so do others see in us that love for Him? Do they see it in our words and in our actions? We have to realize that Jesus Christ has the right to tell us what to do because He is God. Jesus is God. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later, John says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word he was talking about, of course, is Jesus Christ. He is God, and God does have the right to tell us what to do. His Word hasn't changed in over 2,000 years. And neither has our responsibility to obey that word. Because he is God and because of our love for him, we have a responsibility to obey him. Remember, we are not our own. The Bible makes it clear. We've been bought with a price. And that is the shed blood of Jesus on Calvary. So the marching orders of the church are not just good suggestions. They're authoritative orders from our commander-in-chief. Secondly, I want you to notice that they are challenging orders. Understand the meaning of these orders. The Greek word used here, translated in verse 19, as nations is ethnos. Let's look at verse 19. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The literal meaning of that word, ethnos, is all races, all tribes, all people. Wow, what a challenge. 
That means all the people who are not like us right here in our community. It also means all the people who are living on the other side of the world and everyone in between. So why do we give to mission endeavors? Why do we take the gospel message with us whenever we go? Why do we visit the unchurched in our community? Here's the answer. This is the 2019 translation of the Great Commission. We are on the go. And as we go, we take the gospel message to others. Very simple. When we ourselves cannot go, we do our part in sending others to do so. It's a challenge. It's a challenge we're called to accept. Why is it so important that we do that? Why is it so important that we fulfill the Great Commission? Think about it. Remember the hope that filled your heart when you first accepted Jesus? Remember how excited it, it, it made you? Remember how, how much joy knowing Christ gave you? That's the hope that this world needs. Because right now, there's not a lot of hope in our world. There are a lot of hurting people without hope. They've never met Jesus. People are dying all around us without Christ in their hearts. And this is the hope they need. It's vitally important that we reach the world with the truth of the gospel message. And we begin right here in our own community. The truth is, you see, Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming back soon to take the church. And when he does, there are going to be a lot of people left behind. And if he tarries, multitudes will die before that day, and they will forever be separated from God in a devil's hell. That's not encouraging, is it? That's the fate that no Christian wants to wish on anyone. If we truly love Jesus, we would not wish that on anyone but we are the only ones who can point them to the truth. We must be about our Father's business. It's challenging, but it's what we're called to do. It's not an easy task. In order to reach all the nations, we must be willing to move beyond our own prejudices. We must be willing to move beyond our comfort zones. We must be willing to reach out to a world that's in need. Now, the condition of our world today may cause us to want to, to hunker down and take shelter, seek refuge in God's house, comfort ourselves with the huddled with our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's that very condition out there that makes us want to get away from it. It's that very condition that makes it all the more important that we go out there into it and take with us the gospel. To be salt and light in a dark world, in a decaying world. They're authoritative orders. They're challenging orders. But they are also empowered orders. That's the good news. They are empowered orders. Verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's power, brother. To know that Jesus is with us. That's power. 
Can I fulfill the Great Commission? No. Can you? No. How about Robert L. Baptist Church? Can we fulfill the Great Commission? No. But with this final promise, the church of Jesus Christ is given the power to fulfill the Great Commission. Without it, we would be rendered completely powerless. And so, if Christ isn't above all and in all, we do as a church. And if the Great Commission is not the primary criteria we use to decide what we do as a church, then we're without power. But if we obey the Great Commission, and if we're willing to go, He'll give us the power that we need to accomplish His will. It's the presence and power of the Lord Jesus through His Holy Spirit that makes it possible for the church to carry out His commands. See, the church isn't some powerless band of believers who lives in a world and gets kicked around by the world while we wait for Christ to return. The good news is we are empowered. We possess the Holy Spirit of the God of the universe. That's power. And we have orders to, to carry out His sacred work here in this world that He created. It's not an easy task and it's not a glamorous task. What it means is getting our hands dirty. What it means is, is sometimes getting our hearts broken. Sometimes it means that Christ is going to be rejected. We may even be ridiculed or persecuted. But just remember that only Christ can save. We can't force anyone to accept Him. We cannot blame ourselves if we've done our job and people refuse to accept Him. But we've got to do our job in sharing the gospel. The most frequent objection to the Great Commission that I hear from Christians, Christians who allow Satan to convince them that they cannot share the gospel. They cannot speak to others about Christ. And the fact is, there are many opportunities for us to use our gifts and share the love of Christ with other people. We can't all go to Africa. But there are many missionaries who will not have the opportunity to go without our support. And there are many who can go to Africa who will never be able to reach Richmond County like you and I can. Who will never be able to reach your workplace like you can. Who will never be able to reach those in your school like you can. See, we're not all called to go to Africa. Being a Christian indeed bears the responsibility of sharing the gospel. It doesn't matter what our occupation may be. We can at all times be a positive witness for Jesus Christ. Remember the story I shared last week about Bobby Richardson? The seventh game, 1962 World Series. San Francisco Giants having a man on second. The Yankees decided to change pictures. And right there, in the seventh game of the World Series, Bobby Richardson goes to the guy standing on second and begins to, to tell him about Jesus and ask him, does he know Jesus? And then that base runner, when he 
got back to the dugout going to a, a, another player, Felipe Alou, and, and saying, what's going on with you people? You're always talking about Jesus. He couldn't understand what made Christians so eager to talk about Jesus, even in highly unusual situations. How about you this morning? Would you have done what Bobby Richardson did? The gospel message is the message that people desperately need to hear. They need to hear it. We're often very quick to share our political opinions. We're often very quick to share our business expertise. How quick are we to share Jesus? What people really need. We've got to be passionate about witnessing to the lost. There are a lot of important issues in the life of the church. We've got to be willing to address them. But there is absolutely nothing more important than telling people about Jesus. Nothing. It's more than a matter of life and death. It's a matter of heaven and hell. It's a matter of eternity. Michael Green tells of his visit with a, a doctor who happened to be a cancer specialist, developed leukemia while just in his 40s, and he was dying. And at the beginning of his illness, the man happened to be agnostic. But he began to read during his sickness, during his treatments. And he read a couple of books that, that brought him to a, a clear and joyful faith in the risen Jesus. But he told Michael Green that he had some anger still at the Christian community. He said, why in 40 some odd years have I never been presented with this clearly face to face? Why did I have to read it in a book? Why didn't another Christian tell me about Jesus? You know, a lot of us try to stay informed on the Bible and topics the Bible addresses, and it's important that we do so. We're interested maybe in, in biblical marriage, in the family, or, or we talk about issues like abortion and pornography, how they affect our society, what the Bible has to say about them. And it's good when we can talk intelligently about these things. But it's even more important that we're able to point a lost person to faith in Jesus. That's what people really need to hear about. They need to hear that they're loved by God and that there is a way for them to be saved. It's what we must do. It's the most important thing that we will ever do as a church or as individual Christians to tell people about Jesus. Nothing more important than the salvation of lost souls. God will use us to bring them to Himself if we're willing vessels. If we are willing vessels. See, Jesus has given us the marching orders. Not orders that will burden us, but orders that will allow us the honor and privilege of being used to make an eternal difference in the lives of people that He loves. The question then is, will we obey Him? 